Hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv. As I mentioned last week, today we are diving into the epic story of the Titanomachy, the War of the Titans. But not just that. Along with the war itself, we're going to cover as much about the actual Titans as we can. The Titans are a funny group, and one that I think a lot of you are particularly interested in. They're fascinating overall, given the general understanding of them is that they did rule at one point, were overthrown by Zeus and his siblings, along with a couple of the Titans themselves, and then were relegated to various forms of lesser importance, some locked away, others just lesser gods than they've once been considered. At the same time, did the ancient Greeks themselves believe at any point that they were ruled by Kronos as a king of the gods, or did they always understand it as something that took place in the past, before humanity? There's probably scholarship about this, but it's just something I've thought about in the moment, frankly, so I haven't dug into it. But before we get into the Titans as gods before the gods, some fun news about some upcoming episodes. As I've mentioned, this coming Friday won't be another Argonautica quite yet, but instead a conversation with Jennifer Saint, author of the upcoming novel Ariadne. As you might imagine, it's about Ariadne. It's an amazing retelling, and we have a great conversation about the book and mythology itself. And next Tuesday's episode will be a special episode. It's a conversation, not on a conversation episode day. I spoke with Nikita Gill, author of Great Goddesses, amongst other, so many other incredible books. I'm using this as a regular episode because I know so many of you are already fans of Nikita Gill. In fact, her brilliant book was gifted to me by an amazing listener who even gave me a handwritten note in it about how much she loved it and thought of me. We talked about goddesses and mythology and Medusa and so, so many other characters and concepts. And honestly, it was just truly one of the best conversations I've had for this show, and I want to make sure everyone has a chance to hear it. That, and while I need some time to work on some writing beyond the podcast, unfortunately, this gives me a week off from writing 4,000 words. We got to do what we got to do. I've also recently spoken to Elodie Harper, the author of an upcoming novel called The Wolf Den. It is an incredible book about enslaved women working in a brothel in ancient Pompeii, but it's more about their lives and hopes and how they cope and efforts to free themselves of that life. It was really so good. Highly recommend. That episode is upcoming. Just a bit of a TBD on exactly when it will release. And finally... I've come up with a kind of fun new idea. I'm not totally sure what I'm going to do with it at this stage, but I'm still going to put the call out. I'm going to try to put together something about everyone's hatred for Theseus, because it's kind of become my brand as of late, and I really find it entertaining. And I thought, why not include listeners in that? So if you want to tell me why you hate Theseus and potentially have it run on the show or in social media, please send me a voice memo telling me exactly what you think of Theseus. You can send it to mythsbaby at gmail.com and, you know, by sending it in, you do consent to my using it either on the show or social media or the like. I won't be able to use everything and I won't be able to respond to everyone, but I'm going to do my best and hopefully we'll have some fun with old Theseus. But that's enough about the thrilling up and coming happenings on the podcast. Back To today's episode, all about the Titans, those primordial gods, the gods who ruled before the Olympians. This is episode 122. The Troubling Titan Timeline and Terrible Titanomachy. Last week I told you about the first generation of Titans, the children of Gaia and Uranus. Hyperion, Iapetus, Chius and Creos, Mnemosyne, Oceanus, and Phoebe. 
Tethys, Thea, Themis, and finally Kronos and Rhea, the parents of the first generation of Olympians. As with all Greek mythology, this list is not exhaustive. There are so many sources and versions that you're always bound to find another name tucked in there. But I've gone with the most so-called canon of the first generation of Titans. The second generation, meanwhile, is made up of even more Titan gods and includes even more names you're likely to find familiar. Like, Dion was the Titan goddess of the Oracle of Dodona, who, according to Homer, was the mother of Aphrodite by Zeus. Or Atlas, the Titan god of endurance, daring, and the art of astronomy. Atlas, who holds the heavens on his shoulders, not the earth, though art would have you believe it. Atlas was the son of the Titans Iapetus and Clymene, along with his equally famous brothers Prometheus and Epimetheus. The second-gen Titans Helios, the Sun, Selene, the Moon, and Eos, the Dawn, are the children of the Titans Hyperion and Thea. The Titan Astraeus is the god of the stars and planets, and the father of the Animoi, the Four Winds. The Titan Leto, who we all know and love as the mother of Artemis and Apollo, was born to the Titan goddess Phoebe. Hecate is one of these second-generation Titans, and Matis, mother of Athena. The Muses, too, are sometimes referred to as Titans, given they are the children of Mnemosyne, one of the first generation of Titans. Pallas was the Titan god of Warcraft, and yes, one version of his story notes that Athena's defeat of this Titan is where she took the name and her famed Aegis. Pallas, with the Titan Styx, the goddess of hatred, was the father of Nike, victory, Zelos, rivalry, Kratos, strength, and Bia, power. Perseus was the titan god of destruction, father to Hecate with the titan goddess Astraea, the goddess of stars, and Eurynome, the titan goddess of meadows, with whom Zeus was the father of the charities, the graces. I don't think this is a hard and fast rule, because nothing is, but it seems to me that titans are much more literal representations of things and concepts, more so than the Olympian gods. Like, Helios is the sun, and Selene is the moon, in a way that Zeus is not the sky, nor is he thunder and lightning. I say again, this is not an exhaustive list of the second generation titans, but a full list would be simply exhausting. So those are, for the most part, the Titans. But what of the actual war, that thing we call a Titanomachy? Well, we know it was a major part of Greek mythology. We know it was important, recognized. We know, for the most part, which Titan sided with Kronos and which sided with Zeus. But the details? Much of them are lost. There was an epic poem in the style of Homer that covered the Titanomachy, but it's lost. Hesiod talks of it, though, in the most detail that I've found, but it's also in his kind of Hesiodic way. And Apollodorus spends one small paragraph on it in his Library of Greek Mythology. So today, I relay you the story of the Titanomachy to the best of both my and the source's abilities. But to begin, we must begin at the beginning. <laughs> Last week, we talked of Gaia and the beginning of everything. We covered the defeat of her husband, Uranos, by their son, Kronos, with his mother's help. We talked of all her children. But as you all likely know, given it's my first episode of this podcast and the one everyone seems to start with, even though I tell them how much better things have gotten since then, things with Kronos devolve, for lack of a better term. Kronos takes power. And he loves power. He reigns with an iron fist. But he also has heard a prophecy that he will be overthrown by his son. So he seeks to prevent that from happening, as those in Greek myth are wont to do. Still, he won't actually avoid having children to begin with. That would be simply too rational. And besides, he wants to have sex with his sister wife, Rhea. And they do, and Rhea does get pregnant because goddesses always do. One by one, the pair have children, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, 
And one by one, Kronos swallows the children whole, the very moment their lungs breathe a breath of air. Rhea, as one might imagine, doesn't love this. She isn't afraid of her children overthrowing her, and frankly, she's enjoying making a family with that horrid man, and she wants her children alive, damn it. So finally, she does indeed turn against the horrid man, and she plots in advance of the birth of their sixth child. With the help of some other gods and some preparation having taken place down on the island of Crete, Rhea manages to save her sixth child, Zeus, from his father's hungry belly. Rhea gives birth to the child in secret, and before Kronos even knows he has another baby, Zeus has been whisked off to the island of Crete where he's raised by one of a handful of characters, depending on the source you're reading. And Rhea, knowing she can't hide it from Kronos for long, wraps a large stone in swaddling clothes and hands it over to Kronos, announcing with fanfare the birth of their sixth child. And of course, down it goes into Kronos' mouth and into the depths of his belly where the rock meets Kronos and Rhea's five other children, who are, presumably, just chilling out in there, wishing they weren't stuck in their father's smelly belly. Meanwhile, on Crete, Zeus grows up without the threat of Kronos. He did, however, grow up resenting Kronos for, you know, devouring his five siblings. So Zeus grew up plotting his revenge on his father. When he was old enough, he carried it out. Because we're talking about the Titanomachy here today, I'm not going to dive into the details, because frankly, my Titanomachy research has not reminded me of exactly how Zeus defeated Kronos, just that he did it. So he forced his father, Kronos, to vomit up his five siblings. One by one, they re-emerged into the world. Poseidon, Hades, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia. Bing, bang, boom! The original six Olympians are reborn. The fun dynamics of their birth story mean both Zeus and Hestia are simultaneously the youngest and the eldest of the siblings. How adorably weird. Now, as one might imagine, being raised on an island away from your family with the express intention that you grow up big and strong enough to defeat your titan father and force him to vomit up your siblings, which he ate the moment they were born, might cause a bit of resentment. Zeus had saved his siblings, and they were living happily on Mount Olympus as the first generation of Olympians, but things weren't quite happily ever after. Still, they bided their time. For now, it was about creating a whole world of gods and goddesses separate from the Titans. During this period, a number of the most important gods and goddesses come into being. People like Athena and Ares and Artemis and Apollo. We know this not necessarily because it's explicit in their birth stories, but because they take part in the forthcoming Titanomachy, and so they simply must have been born before it took place. So imagine all of these gods are coming into being during this time, when we're to imagine Kronos is still around, along with many of the other titans, but we don't actually know anything about the details or drama or the like. Remember, it's best not to dwell on chronology in Greek mythology. It will only make you frustrated, and you won't find yourself getting anywhere. Thousands of years of varying stories will do that. Ultimately, though, we know that Zeus and his Olympian siblings also freed the Hecatonchires from Tartarus or Gaia, wherever it was they were imprisoned by Kronos after they were freed by Kronos after being imprisoned by Uranus. I'm thinking Tartarus, that Uranus locked them in Gaia herself, and when Kronos killed Uranus, he freed them from his mother before imprisoning them again, but this time in Tartarus? Sometimes I just stop and really think about the sheer volume of bizarre ancient Greek names and stories that are stuck in my head for the rest of time. Because if you think I'm not telling most of this bit from memory, you would be sorely mistaken. So, the Hecaton Kyries are free. This appears to have come whilst they're generally up against the Titans, though we don't have specifics on anything. And they're not a fan of Kronos, these Hecaton Kyries, what with him imprisoning them for millennia and whatnot. This, along with Zeus's general desire for complete power over the world and its beings, 
is what sparks the Titanomachy. Because yes, finally, the actual war is here. For the Titan gods and as many as sprang from Kronos had long been fighting together in stubborn war with heart grieving toil, the lordly Titans from high Othris, but the gods, givers of good, whom rich haired Rhea bare in union with Kronos from Olympus. So they with bitter wrath were fighting continually with one another at that time for ten full years, and the hard strife had no close or end for either side, and the issue of the war hung evenly balanced. But when he had provided those three with all things fitting, nectar and ambrosia which the gods themselves eat, and when their proud spirit revived within them all after they had fed on nectar and delicious ambrosia, then it was that the father of men and gods spoke amongst them. Hear me, bright children of earth and heaven, that I may say what my heart within me bids— a long while now have we, who are sprung from Kronos and the Titan gods, fought with each other every day to get victory and to prevail. But do you show your great might and unconquerable strength and face the Titans in bitter strife? For remember our friendly kindness, and from what sufferings you are come back to the light from your cruel bondage under misty gloom through our councils. So, with this section from Hesiod's Theogony, Zeus has gotten the Hecaton Kyries free from Kronos and on his side in the Ten Years' War with the Titans. It wasn't hard, I'm certain they weren't thrilled with Kronos and were just happy to be freed, let alone be fed ambrosia and nectar. How could they refuse Zeus after that? With the gods, the Hecaton Kyries begin their attack on the Titans who have sided with Kronos. For many of them, names like Prometheus and Atlas and Hecate, they have sided with Zeus. Quote, and on the other part, the Titans eagerly strengthened their ranks, and both sides at one time showed the work of their hands and their might. The boundless sea rang terribly around, and the earth crashed loudly. Wide heaven was shaken and groaned, and high Olympus reeled from its foundation under the charge of the undying gods, and a heavy quaking reached dim Tartarus and the deep sound of their feet in the fearful onset and of their hard missiles. So then they launched their grievous shafts upon one another, and the cry of both armies as they shouted reached to starry heaven, and they met together with a great battle cry. The battle raged on, with Zeus hurling lightning bolt after lightning bolt at the Titans, and the Hecaton Kyries using their hundred hands each to attack and throw boulders and whatever else they can at Kronos and his Titans. The Hecaton Kyries have a huge hand in this battle. They're free for the first time in their lives, having been imprisoned first by their father, Uranus, and later by Kronos once he defeated Uranus. They're strong, they've got a shit ton of arms, they're giants, and they're pissed the hell off. Still, the battle rages on and on. Though we don't have much in the way of details, we know it was loud, destructive, and seemed as if the very earth and heavens themselves were crashing in. From Hesiod, quote, The life-giving earth crashed around in burning, and the vast wood crackled loud with fire all about. All the land seized, and ocean streams and the unfruitful sea. The hot vapor lapped round the earth-born titans, 
Flame unspeakable rose to the bright upper air. The flashing glare of the thunderstone and lightning blinded their eyes for all that there were strong. The point is, they fought. They fought and they fought and it was very, very bad. The action between all of these primordial beings and deities caused every form of destruction imaginable. There were earthquakes and storms, thunder and lightning. It truly seemed like the world would end. And finally, the titans who sided with Kronos and Kronos himself are defeated once and for all. The Hecatonchires are the ones who imprison them in Tartarus, it seems only right and fair that they be the ones to do it. So they split open the earth, revealing the darkest, most horrible depths of the underworld, the deepest pit of Tartarus, and in go Kronos and the other titans who made the unfortunate mistake of siding with him. In they go, never to be heard from again, beyond the odd worship, for reasons of their own importance to the earth rather than the importance to the pantheon of Olympian gods. But it wasn't all of the Titans who sided with Kronos against Zeus and the Olympians, and so it wasn't all of the Titans who ended up imprisoned in the depths of Tartarus. There were many who seemed to see sense and chose not to side with the man who'd been devouring his children who'd castrated his father. Some who didn't see Kronos as the safe bet. Some like Atlas, like Prometheus and Epimetheus, like Hecate herself, Helios, Selene, those people most important to the world, they managed to avoid Tartarus, to avoid the wrath of Zeus. As for the Titans locked away in those depths of Tartarus, Hesiod gives us a stunning description not only of their imprisonment, but of Tartarus itself. Hence the extensive Hesiod quotes today. Quote, for a brazen anvil falling from heaven nine nights and days would reach the earth upon the tenth, and again a brazen anvil falling from earth nine nights and days would reach Tartarus upon the tenth. Round it runs a fence of bronze, and night spreads in triple line all about it like a neck circlet, while above grow the roots of the earth and unfruitful sea. There, by the counsels of Zeus who drives the clouds, the titan gods are hidden under misty gloom, in a dank place where are the ends of the huge earth, and they may not go out, for Poseidon fixed gates of bronze upon it, and a wall runs all around it on every side. There Gaius and Cotus and the great-souled Ubrarius live, trusted warders of Zeus who holds the aegis. Tartarus is as far beneath the earth as earth is beneath the sky. It's fenced in, it's untouchable, and there the titans are guarded by the Hecatonchires, who get to remain once more in Tartarus, but this time Zeus has found a way to convince them they're doing it for the greater good. Anyway, I just feel quite bad for the Hecatonchires. When all is said and done, the Titans are safely locked away in the depths of Tartarus. Zeus and his fellow Olympians take their place as the pantheon of gods for the Hellenic world, and things appear to have calmed, to be running smoothly. The gods feel like they can breathe a sigh of relief. Then. Then Gaia has another child. This time Gaia has a child with Tartarus itself, the personification of that darkest, deepest depths of the underworld where only the most heinous, the most horrific of characters are meant to exist. That child is Typhaeus, Typhon. Quote, Strength was with his hands in all that he did, and the feet of the strong god were untiring. From his shoulders grew a hundred heads of a snake, a fearful dragon with dark, flickering tongues. And from under the brows of his eyes, in his marvelous heads flashed fire, and fire burned from his heads as he glared. 
And there were voices in all his dreadful heads which uttered every kind of sound imaginable. For at one time they made sound such that the gods understood, but at another the noise of a bull bellowing aloud in proud, ungovernable fury. And at another the sound of a lion, relentless of heart. And at another sounds like whelps, wonderful to hear. And again at another he would hiss, so that the high mountains echoed. Typhaeus was a bit scary the understatement of an eon. But Zeus saw the monster coming, or heard him, or sensed him. One way or another, Zeus realized the existence of Typhaeus quick enough to act on it. He sprung into action, launching himself from Olympus and showering the monster with fire and lightning bolts. He scorched the earth in his path, but he managed to destroy the monster, to singe its heads, to defeat it once and for all. Typhaeus, too, Zeus cast into the depths of Tartarus to exist alongside the Titans, guarded over by the Hecatonchires. And now, now, finally, finally, the Olympian gods really and truly did rule over the earth and all its deities and creatures. Finally, they could set about sorting things out, determining who would rule where, what each god would do. They finally had time to think about all the mortal lives they could ruin, and how. Oh, nerds, thank you so much for listening. Like last week, I really enjoyed this episode. It's nice being able to tell these stories where, sure, bits of it were included in that very first episode of this podcast, but because of how much my skills and resources have changed over the past almost four years, I'm able to tell so much more of the story and in so much more detail without necessarily repeating too much from that first episode. I hope to find more examples like this, because like I said, there really is lots more brand new information to cover, but it can often be so much more time consuming and exhausting to research. So I need to be able to find stories like these in between, where the sourcing is more easy to interpret and retell. I need to find that happy medium in between, just to keep my own sanity. The Titans especially. I know so many people are interested in them, so I'm thrilled to have covered them. One thing I imagine many of you might be wondering, though, is what the explicit differences between titans and gods, or why some became more important and famous than others, and that applies to gods and titans. But the thing you have to remember about Greek mythology is that they weren't coming up with these stories in the way we come up with stories now, or the way we write novels or plays or movies. Today we write these things with the intention of telling a story. Then they were coming up with these ideas and concepts overall as a way to understand the world around them. I think in the case of the gods and titans, they could probably see that the world around them was older than they could imagine. So they might have used that as a reason to have all these generations of deities that came before the gods that they worshipped at that moment. This is certainly true of humanity. It's just that it wasn't explicitly like the Titans who were being worshipped, say, a thousand years before Hesiod. It was some other god. But in order to understand that, the Titans were thought of. Anytime you're confused or curious or you wonder why it is that I haven't done a full and extensive episode on any god or titan that I've referenced in passing, just remember that these stories were originally told by bards, singers across the regions, singing songs and weaving tales. Eventually, maybe even hundreds of years after the first bard told the tale, it might have been written down. But pieces were lost, things were changed. And then add another few hundred years in between that and the next source, say, the plays. And you've got more changes, more additions, more missing pieces. It's endless. And that's not even taking into consideration all the things that we know did exist, but that we don't have. Things like the epic poem about the Theogony, that we know it existed, but we don't have a copy of it. There's just so, so much we don't know. But also so, so much that they didn't necessarily care to come up with answers to. They were using these concepts and characters to understand the world they lived in. That meant that some things just didn't matter as much or didn't have a story that they had to have behind them, even though we might wish now that it did. Anyway, I could go on and on, as I often do. These intricacies are my favorite part of studying all of this. The versions, the dates of those versions, the things we lost. Ugh, it's fucking fascinating. Thank you all so much. You are the best, and I hope you enjoyed this. I am Liv, and I love this shit so, so very much.